Welcome back to our workshop. Today I'm going to take a deep dive into the confusing topic of wood stains for furniture restoration. How do you get that wood stain to match so your repair just disappears? Well, I've been taught by a professional finisher how to use acrylics, but it's one of only maybe six different ways to do that. I've got a separate video on this. Today I've got another business owner who does furniture repairs, and he's going to share tips and techniques of how he does stain matching. Stick with me, we'll show you how it's done. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. The front rail here, you can see this has been broken off. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. I live in the greater Toronto area and my guest is from North Carolina. So let me fire up Zoom and we'll get started. Today I've got Bob from Furniture Remedy with me. Bob, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Scott. Bob, tell the audience a little bit about your experience and your background. Sure. Uh, I've always liked to fix things. About 20 years ago, I started working in a furniture store and I just started putting little things together, trying to do simple repairs. And unfortunately, that company started to go out of business and I was directed to another company where I was hired and they sent me to Texas for three months to learn everything from color mixing to upholstery. Wow. And stay with that company for almost 10 years where I ended up being a field supervisor, covered five states with another supervisor and over 40 technicians that we trained and kept tabs on as <laughs> the things went on. And since then, I've kind of bounced around a little bit. I've worked for other companies. I've worked for different people and different facets. And about five years ago, my wife and I started Furniture Remedy where, where we fix the furniture and uh, have it all under one, one roof. Wow, that's great. So Bob has recorded a video that we're going to watch and he's got a repair that he's completed and he's about to get into the color staining. So let's jump into the video and see how Bob does his work. We've got a broken arm here for this chair. But now I've got all these places where the color's missing or I sanded the joinery smooth. So you could, if you're in a hurry, use a touch-up pen and go along, and it's going to be a little too dark and a little too red, and take anything and lighten it up a little bit. And that doesn't look too bad. Go on the edges with it. Primarily, I use touch-up pens for these areas, like that. Not so much in the show area, but what you end up getting is pretty close, but not quite what you wanted. But most people just scribble it on like that. But this is just a painter's wipe that keeps my fingers wet that helps me move that color around a little bit. So if you have a touch-up pen that's pretty close, that's one way to do it. If you've got comments or questions as you're watching this video, put them in the comments below and Bob will reply to them directly. You can also find Bob on Instagram. I'll leave the link to that in the video description. The bigger the area, the more stuff you have to do. With a touch-up pen, you have to scribble all this in, blend it all in. By that time, your hands are filthy. You've changed the color irrevocably probably in some areas and there's really just no finesse in it. The way I was taught, and we were taught not to use markers. They were kind of like a backup. We were taught with colors. So all these are pigments. This is burnt sienna, which in this case is my red. And this is burnt umber, in this case is my brown. And this is canary yellow, which obviously is my yellow. Now, put these both the yellow and the red together, you get brown. Put a little blue, you get a darker brown. Color theory. Bob, what do you mean by color theory? Is that something you can explain to the average person that doesn't know about color theory? Yeah, absolutely. I was trying to explain it to my, my boys over the summer. Uh, it's pretty basic. They're primary colors, yellow, red, and blue. And if you mix those colors in different proportions, you can make other colors. Like yellow and blue make green. So just knowing what those colors are, what you can do with those primary colors and make with them is what I mean by color theory. So 
we take yellow and blue, we make green, and we add some red to it, now we have probably a greenish brown. But the more red we add to it, the more actual brown it gets. And then we can add so much red that it's a reddish brown. Okay. And so you can use yellow and red to scale your color back and forth until you dial it into fairly close to what you're looking for. Uh, you always try to make it a little lighter, a little brighter, because once it cures and you put a finished coat on it, it's going to darken up just a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I guess for people that uh, aren't familiar with color theory, and, and this might be new, uh, there is something called uh, a color wheel for furniture. It's, it's more browns. It's not those artistic colors, those nice colors you see behind Bob there in his workshop. Um, but if I take a close look here, it actually shows you if you were to mix yellow and here's burnt umber, this is the tone you would get. And if you were to rotate that over where you add green to it, you get an idea of what that color looks like. You add red and it changes the color. So this can be something that uh, could help to start with. Bob, do you use a wheel like this? I don't anymore, but again, I've been doing it for 20 years. I, there, there aren't many colors that stump me anymore. Okay. So you're able to pick up what's missing and add it in to get where you need to be? Typically. And now I have so many helper pigments that I can get pretty close a lot quicker than I said, when I was in training, we just got those basic, uh, we started with red, yellow, and blue, and we had to come up with a basic color for each thing. When we got a little more advanced, we were at, given a brown. So we could start with a brown and make it more yellow or more red. Okay. And then there are different ones that are just yellow or a yellowish wheat color, or like you were saying, the, the umber colors. So you yeah. can just start with umber and then adjust the umber to the umber that you need. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, I'm really excited to see where this repair goes. So let's jump back into the video. In this case, I'm pretty sure burnt sienna is going to be pretty close to that, but that's just me. And years and years of experience talking. So you don't want a very wet brush because you don't want, just like when you're painting, you don't want paint to get everywhere. But if we take this area and just slowly, very lightly brush it on, and it's looking pretty good. You can take a little lacquer, spray a little lacquer on it, see what that final result is. That's just a little bit red. It takes a lot of yellow to move something, to move the color. And you can see that color shift now. And then when you go back to draw your brush off, you can see how that color shifted. It's definitely more brown. A lot of the red's been washed out, but that's okay. Just take a little bit more red. In this case, it's our burnt sienna. Mix it in there. Wipe off our excess pick up our piece and you can even go, you can wipe this off with the Will Pro, go back to bare wood, or if you had some practice, you can put this on top. And what you want to avoid are those little blurps like that, where the brush just stroke just ends. And I can only do this with my left hand, but what you want to do is feather your color on very lightly up and down and lift up towards the ends. And then you don't get those hard edges. You get a nice smooth transition. So we can do that side. Actually, we can do all of this. We do that. And it's one of those things with, that takes practice. And you kind of know what the color that you need is without the lacquer when you get there. You can see there's a lot of yellow in there. Uh, it's kind of greenish looking. But we can keep, fix that in post-production. So I'll take our lacquer. What I'm shooting for is the background color, not this foreground red and brown 
with all the grain. I'm shooting for that, that color right there. That's kind of in the background behind that. And I think we're pretty close. Be sure to go to our website and subscribe to our newsletter for links to new videos, workshop tips, and more. Now back to fixing furniture. One of the ways you can get closer, again, I learned we were front corners were frowned on. Just lightly go over it, and you can see like that makes it up pretty close to where we need to get. We can go over the top there, and go over that side a little bit. That has gotten it a little bit dark. So in this position, if it's a little bit darker here, it's not gonna matter so much here. You wanna to try to fix things where they live, or in the position that they live because that's the light, the lighting that will be shed upon. So I think that doesn't look too bad for what it is. Now this side, this is gonna be the outside of the arm. This is gonna be the show piece. So I don't wanna see this transition line at all where I glued that back together. Although it's very smooth because I did a very good job. But you see the color's a little bit off. It's not quite dark enough. It is red enough, we got the background. So I'm gonna just try to hit it with the toner. See where that gets us. And that isn't terrible. You can still see that transition line. Which is no big deal. Because once we get it back together, and this arm is going to be it's gonna look like this. Let's make sure I got it in the right position when we're done. So again, this gives us a little shadow. It color, covers up some of the color when we match it to look. So what we need to do is make this, see this is a little bit lighter in this area. It's lighter here to this darkness here. So we just need to bring some darkness into that side. There's a couple of different ways you can do that. I wouldn't recommend the touch-up pin at this point. Um, you can try the finger tap method. And just, and I'm just tapping a little of the burnt umber right in that area. But that's darker than burnt umber. I'm fairly certain. But we'll see. It's getting there, but it's not quite where we want it to be. Wow, Bob, I didn't realize that you could just put a little bit of that powder on there and then hit it with lacquer and boom, you've got a color. Yeah, I, it's not one of the things that I learned in training. It's one of the things I learned on the road from, you know, I, I guess we call them the old timers. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a trick where they use the powders and I've met people that just use primarily their fingers to yeah. put a little bit on. Uh, and use a lacquer or a, some kind of finish. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's wet, the, the powders will do their thing. Uh, it's, you can mix it in a lacquer, but those are gonna dry so quickly, you're not gonna have time to work with it before that color sets. So that's why the padding finish is nice because you can mess with it a little bit longer. It has a, a longer play time. Okay. So, but you can use your finger, uh, brushes, sponges. It depends on the effect you're going for, too. Uh, you know, in training, we use balled up pieces of aluminum foil and put color on it to kind of make a burled effect. Oh. The color would stick on the ridges of the aluminum foil. And as you press it on the wood, you just get those little ridges. Oh, neat. And then you can seal that in and then go over it in layers. Starting with the powders and just using your imagination, you can get just about any effect you think that you want to have. Okay. Uh, sea sponges make a really cool design too. Uh, I've just picked up little things uh, here and there and, uh, oh, well, that would make that design or that would make the grain match in that area if I used a, a darker color and you know, makes it a, a, a sponge. So when you're tapping it on, um, you're using just a straight color there. So if you're looking to blend colors, 
Would you do it that way or go back to the padding lacquer to mix the colors? For me, I would go back to the padding lacquer. Uh, the okay. old timers would do it all right there on the spot. They would just add a little bit of yellow and then they go back and forth until they got what they wanted there. Hmm. Uh, I like to see it. That's the little rag I have where I wipe off the excess. I've kind of gotten to where I can see it on the rag and know what it's going to look like on the wood. Uh, okay, let's jump back into the video. Really the quickest way to get something darker is to use a dark color. Um, you get there with raw umber, but this is kind of a green. So it's going to take us out of our color sphere a little bit further than I want. Van Dyke Brown which is also kind of has a green hue to it. I don't want to go any green. I just want a shadow. So we use the black pigment and I mean, that's probably too much. You just want to get a little on your brush and your brush is fairly dry at this point. So you can just dry brush it on. It's kind of the same process as the finger tap. You're just dry brushing this on, kind of patting that area, just to keep that, to hide that transition. I'm just gonna give it a little bit more. If I get too much, that's okay. I just put it on my towel here. And then I've got some shadow on my brush. I just tap that shadow on that line. And take our lacquer. And you see how shiny that's already getting. And I don't want it that shiny because it's not that shiny. The sheen is off. So you can spray it with flat and bring it back down. I can still see I didn't get it dark enough in there, but just take some steel wool. This is four aught steel wool. So four zeros steel wool. You can see how it brings that shine back down. And now our line is looking more and more like it's part of the wood, like it's a grain line, which is essentially what you want. And you can take all the color off and go back down to bare wood and build it back up. But that's a lot of work. It's a lot of steps and we don't need to. One of the other things that we were indoctrinated with over and over again. Like you could just use a touch up pen and get some of this stuff done. But a lot of times your touch up pen doesn't get you where you want to be. So that's way too dark. And what you end up doing is spending 30 minutes trying to make a bad color look like a good color. And you could have spent 20 minutes just making the color the right way, the way that you're supposed to do it. See, we'll just put a little bit of color on top of that. According to the company I work for and doing it the way that you're supposed to do it. And then you don't have to worry about it. You can see that's way too dark. So here we go. Back with the steel wool. The steel wool, since that's not dry enough, it's rubbing off some of the color. Which, you know, since we didn't have the great color anyway, that's okay. So we'll take a little bit of 320, just sand that down. And then we're just going to concentrate on that area again. That's what's nice about mixing your own colors and having this at your fingertips because something goes wrong. You just go back to what you had, maybe mix it down a little bit, mix it back up. See, this is getting too weirdly brown, so I need to get a good bit more red into it. So Bob, what I like about you showing us that you're taking this back is that this is much of an art. Um, you're experimenting and trying and seeing how this works, and you're not always going to get it right, so it shouldn't be intimidating, right? Yeah, it is. 
it's trial and error. It, you have to have a good eye for it or develop an eye for it. I, when I was in training for three months, some people could get through the training much quicker because they had a better eye. It took me three months to get the eye that I needed to have to go out on the road. Uh, so I had a really great trainer who was really patient and would allow me to make those mistakes and go back and learn again. And even now, as you can see, I get busy, I get distracted, I put a little too much of this in, and it's you, know, you get simply to a point where you just go back, back a couple of steps and move forward again and just learn that, okay, well, that didn't work the last time. And as long as you're making progress and moving forward every time and not getting stuck in the same step time after time, then it's, you're, you're on your way to becoming an artist with it. <laughs> I never thought of myself that way. And a lot of customers say, oh, well, you really have to have a good artistic eye. And I don't never thought of it that way until they started telling me that. I realized, well, maybe I do have an artistic eye for it now. <laughs> and uh, I, I can get in there a little bit nicer and, and quicker and come out with a better product. Yeah, good. Okay, well, let's jump back in here and see what your next step is. I'll bring it back up to that nice, pretty color. And then we'll just brush that on there. And where we kind of went over with the black, that's okay. We'll just shadow this in a little bit too. And I said, I have a problem with being able to feather with my right hand. When I was in training, I almost didn't pass because I couldn't figure out how to feather. And it's just something with my right hand doesn't want to do this gently and nicely. My right hand's like the hammer. You bring it out when you need to smash something. My left hand does all this nice, delicate stuff. I'll use a little bit of the toner, get it darkened back up. And I think that is going to be our finished product once we build the finish back up. You can see how it's, the sheen is different. It's because when I sanded it and used the steel wool, I took a lot of that sealer off. I took a lot of the black lacquer off with it. While I have that other piece drying, uh, went back to this piece, put a little color on it, and I decided I would need to put some more grain in it. I think this color is going to hide the grain and cover it up. So one of the things you can do is instead of a lacquer, seal it with a sanding sealer. So you don't really get that sheen build up. So there's our nice color. That looks pretty good. So I'll let that dry for a minute. And then again, there's many ways you can do it. There's graining pencils. You just use colored pencils and make the grain. The way I was taught to make grain, and we'll just keep going back to the way I was taught to do things, is you take finisher's glaze, which is in that jar, mixed with some mineral, mineral spirits to thin it. And a cup and a fancy brush. You put a little bit in the cup. You don't really need much. A little goes a long way with glaze. Um, these aren't necessarily black grain lines, but they're not necessarily just brown. So I'm going to take some of my burnt umber and I'm going to mix it in here. And then I am going to take a little bit of the black and tint that a little darker. This black is nice because when you use it, it doesn't turn it necessarily more green or not. Uh, some blacks turn it a little more green because there's a lot of green and brown in there, but we're not gonna worry about that. So now we've got our brush covered with glaze and I wanna make all these lines. Well, the simplest way I found to do that is just twist the brush. And there you have, I don't know, 50 little brushes that you can make lines with. And I just kind of look, do I do a test, see what that looks like, twist her up again, and then the grain is going this direction, 
So with the grain, I just follow it with my brush. And I don't go over it too much because it's the lines are gonna overlap. On this side, you can just do a little bit of like that. And then we'll look on this side because that grain goes all the way around. It doesn't stop at that edge. And it's gonna go this way and it's gonna go that way. We'll just get it a little bit dry, take our brush and just create some lines. So this is not going to be very dark and you're probably gonna to have to do it a few times to get it dark to where you can see it as much as you want or as little as you want. It's really up to you. Glaze needs to dry and it's gonna look like this. Once it's dry. If you don't do this step, it's going to come back. It's going to dry like this anyway. So it's better just to go ahead and get it dry. Then you can switch it back to reality. And you can see I just swapped those drain lines out a little bit more. I didn't add a lot. I didn't go too heavy. I'll let that dry. I'll probably go one more time with it. Um, Cause I have a problem with knowing when to quit or quitting while I'm ahead. So that's fairly dry. And then just with the grain again, I'm just gonna run up that way and make some lines. They don't even necessarily have to be the same lines. The nice thing about glaze, especially when you're doing it lightly like this, it's not going to show out on you. If you're using a graining pen or pencil, you've got to have the grain kind of down before you do this part. So the other nice thing about glaze, you can take a brush. I like this one because the bristles are a little more stiff. There's nothing on it. I can just run it through the glaze. It's pulling the glaze but it's not letting it stick together. Like the, the lines aren't going together. It's creating new little lines in between because the bristles are stiff enough to do that. We really like the technique that you're showing us here. It's very subtle. And, and what you mentioned was um, these markers, these graining markers can be, I guess, a little bit too much in the forefront or a little too obvious. You have to be very careful with them where and when you use them. Because they are, it's a very strong line, and it's meant to be a strong line. So if I'm going to use one of those, a lot of times I'll pick up an existing grain line and put a ruler next to it and run the, the graining marker semi along the ruler to maintain that line. Okay. You can't ar arbitrarily start a grain line. It's going to be a visual break. Hmm. Uh, so you want to maintain the continuity. And I like glaze because I can start an inch or two back from the repair and drag it all the way across and maintain the continuity without that one break or something standing out too much in the foreground. Okay. But you have to understand once you get the color is great, but a lot of times you're going to lose a lot of the natural markings of the wood along with the color right. or the repair that you've made, depending on the medium that you filled it with, you're going to lose the, the grain of the wood. So if we were to sort of have a spectrum of graining and sort of the most gentle graining maybe being glaze, the, the marker being the more severe, um, would the china marker sort of be in the middle? Yeah, china markers are great because you can, you can blend them out a little bit more. You could use a brush. If you put enough pressure on a china marker, it'll give. Okay. That, that line will, won't hold steady. Or you can use your finger or a little towel and you can move or you can soften the line of the china marker. So Bob, are you always using a darker color when you mix that glaze? Uh, in fact, a lot of times I don't even use any color in the glaze. Uh, the next clip coming up shows that. Okay, let's jump into it. And if you really want to get fancy, you can get another brush, regular glaze on this, just clean. I'll just dip it in there. 
I know this brush is clean. See how it fans out, it clumps together, which is good because that's what we're trying for. We're some randomly shaped, spaced grain lines. But you can take it and you can dry it. So those are nice, kind of stiff. And then you can run it through, like if you got your lines too close, you can run this through and it'll create blank places within the colored glaze. The other nice thing about glaze is once it's dry and you put layers on it, it gives the repair a little bit of depth. It can mirror chatoyancy in a way, but especially if you build it up in layers, like usually I'll do at least three layers of grain on a high-end repair. Uh, just so I can get that, that level of clarity. And you can see where it's drying. It's clumped together there. I don't want a big grain line right there. I want it broken up a little bit. So I'll just take that brush and I'll break the grain up. It also looks very similar to blushing. So if you spray finish outdoors or when it's raining or where there's high humidity, if you've done it too fast and let it stack up, it'll blush, which basically you're just capturing layers of moisture between your finish. And when it's dry, the moisture is showing out. You can see I've got a little more clarity there, a little more shimmer. I can still see that line, which in this case is okay because that's the bottom. This is the top. I can't see the line on the top. I'm very happy with the top. So I am going to put a little more shine on it. Now, I would say this has a satin finish overall, but just maybe one or two shots of satin. And so in this section, once I was finished, I wasn't quite comfortable with the way that the grain looked or that it popped. And so I went back to the China marker to give it a little more detail, a little more depth. The glaze provides a lot of the depth, but without a, the China marker being there to kind of provide a, a backdrop for it, you don't really see it. So once you add the China marker, to the glaze portion. You kind of see the depth of the glaze in relationship to the china marker being on top before you add the final finish. Um, sometimes I'll use a ruler with this, just so I can get, because that one's going this way and the grain's going this way. It's not quite parallel. But steel wool is a magical, magical thing, apparently. You can do that. And you get some of that color back in it. And I'm gonna hit with just one more shot of toner. That was a couple of shots, but look at that. I mean, you can sell that in a home all day long, which is what we used to say. I work for a retail store, and as you can imagine, people weren't overly excited about having someone show up and saying, I'm going to fix your broken furniture or furniture that was damaged on delivery. So you had to sell the repair. One part of selling the repair is being able to do the repair. If you're not good at repairing it, you're not going to be able to sell it. Part of it is selling it before you even get there by being on time, communicating clearly. This is just clear satin. Look at that. Yeah. That's going to be nice. I put it all back together. Get all my fingerprints off of it. Any glue residue. That's gonna be really nice. Wow, this is really interesting, Bob. I love the way you've used these different techniques, stuff that I've never seen before. So thank you for sharing that with our audience. Why don't we jump into the finished photos you shared with me so people can see what the end product looks like.
Bob, this is a wonderful repair. I'm sure the customer was happy. How did they react to it? Overall, they were pretty pleased with it. Uh, they couldn't see where it was broken before. They didn't think it could be fixed in the first place. So when I brought it back and the chair had two arms again, uh, it was a family table set. So they were happy that it, it came back home to them. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you, Bob, for sharing your expertise with the audience here. Our channel is all about education, and you've certainly shared a lot of knowledge here. Um, as I mentioned before, Bob's willing to answer questions or even take comments on th this video, so add them below. And Bob, uh, I'll put a link to your Instagram in the section below so that uh, people can reach out to you that way as well and, and follow you along the journeys. I really enjoy watching your Instagram posts uh, to see what you're up to and, and some of the cool stuff you're, you're repairing. Thank you, Scott. It's been fun working with you on this and I, I really enjoy your videos as well. Well, thanks. So thanks everyone for joining us here. If you enjoyed this video, I'll leave another one over here that you might enjoy as well. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture.